right? According to this, we are recording. We'll see. We'll do attendance very quickly. Obviously, if you hear a person, like I said on that announcement, you get twice the attendance points because today is the day where you get to tell my bosses how much you hate me. So I need you here to do that. So that means you get 4.8 points instead of 2.4. Of course, if you're wearing red, you're getting 4.9 instead of 4.8. Let's double that. So it'll be five points instead of two point five. Right. So we got let's see. Eight. And See, give it a little bit of time, maybe somebody show up. We got a few people on the video. Anyway, um, I guess my first announcement will be to remind you I'm traveling this weekend, so if I'm hard to reach, I apologize, and that's why I'm gonna be a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of time on the road. And when I get where I'm going, I'm actually celebrating my daughter's 21st birthday. So even, even if you might, even though I won't be on the road, you probably won't be able to reach me. I'll be busy. Um, but that being said, like I said earlier, even though I hope you guys enjoy your week off, I will be hard at work. So if you need me next week, um, let me know. And would that be a good week to get caught up with some of you? I know at least some of you are concerned about your grades. And I'm, I'm not like happy because you have grades worth concerning about, but I'm happy because you're concerned about them and we can fix them. We have time. What else? I got a great question about independent work. So I want to point this out. If you see here, if you look at if the, the grade sheet, if you look at the first page, which is like everything in one, and you look here and it shows your adjusted independent work, that's your adjusting. Because if you remember at the beginning of the semester, I said you're supposed to get something like six points a week, right? So at week one, if you had seven points and you were to look here, it would say 100, right? Because you have 100% of the points that you should have had. So if you were to look at this number every week, and if I did it diligently, which I haven't, so for a while it hasn't changed, but if you looked at that number every week, you would see that it actually goes down a little bit, depending on what you're doing with your independent work. Because if you're not adding more points to it, then your percentage is going down. Does that make sense? Like right now, on this day, you should have 80-something points, right? So if you have 80-something points right now, it might say 100. But then if you don't write anything between now and next week, next week you should have about six more points than that. So if you don't change anything, then your percentage will go from 100 to like, 90 something. Does that make sense? More importantly, just to make things more simple, if you really want to simplify things, what you need to know is this. If I get it down here, hold on. I hate fighting with technology. Let me pull it off the screen and then back on. If you want to know what your points are, first of all, when you do independent work, usually I write back and say, hey, that was worth this many points and this is your new total. I almost always do that, but just in case, here we go. Let's see if this works. Still didn't work, did it? Still let me go. Try this. Yeah, there we go. Down near the bottom, there's the independent tab. So if you go up here and then go to your right, this is so hard. Oh, sorry guys. So annoying. I'm wasting my time trying to get this, but I just want to make sure you guys aren't confused. It's very important that you're not confused. Okay. Come on. This doesn't work. I'm just going to give up. I think I'm just going to give up. Anyway, if you were to go to the independent work tab, like I have, maybe if I scroll over this way. There we go. Yes. So you can see your actual points here. So this is a great example. This person right here has 70.6 points, which if you were to take that as to what you sh should have at this point, or he, whichever it may be, then that means they have 86.2% of what the points they should have by this week of the semester. Does that make sense? And more importantly, again, if you go to the tap, actual total, you know how many points you have. And that's what you're shooting for. You're just trying to get that number to 100. Or above. Because again, if you get more than 100, it's extra credit. And that's a whole different conversation that we should have uh, separately. Because then your, your sheet is completely different. We don't have time to talk about that. So any questions about independent work? Or anything else with that matter? All right, let's jump into the last chapter of the semester. Chapter 20, Communities and Ecosystems. In a way, this is a lot like Chapter 19 because, again, we're not looking at 
inside of a cell, right? We're not looking at cell-to-cell -cell interaction even. We're not looking inside of a single organism. We're looking at how organisms interact with each other. The last chapter was about populations, right? So we're talking about a single species, um, a single group of animals of the same species that live together and interact together and uh, com compete for the same resources. And now we're finally spreading it out as one bigger notch, right? So instead of looking at one species, now we're looking at a lot of species. That's basically what we're talking about here. We're looking at the Earth as a whole in a sense. So, here we go. Let's talk about it. This first, excuse me, this uh, chapter is broken down into four main bullet points. The first one, this is so important, we're going to talk about biodiversity, then we're going to talk about community ecology, then we're going to talk about ecosystem ecology, then we're going to call, talk about Congress, conservation and restoration biology. Um, oh yeah, and I know I mentioned this earlier, but officially I want to mention that too. Today, around, I guess, 840-ish, um, somebody's going to come in and give you these things to fill out my evaluations. And at that point, class will be over, so I can't be here when you do it. So he's going to give them to you, I'm going to leave, and then I'll see you next Monday. Um, and I guess for that matter, the first word for attendance will be evaluation. And as usual, I'm going to, or I shouldn't say as usual, as is now the case from the rest of the short semester, when I give attendance words, uh, if you're in person, you can feel free to send me the attendance words and then you'll get extra credit. Because I know sometimes, and not you guys specifically, a lot of times people aren't paying attention when they're in person, so you can get extra credit for doing that. Anyway, biodiversity. Let's talk about it. Does anybody know what it is? Can anybody guess? I'm sure you've heard this term before, but what does it mean? What does biodiversity mean? I mean, like, biology classes all over the world where you have some Asian people doing it, some European people doing it. What does biodiversity mean? According to the book, it's a variety of all living things. That is right, and that's the that's the uh, that's the, the definition that you need to know is the variety of living things. That's the most basic definition. Memorize that before you memorize anything else. It's kind of in the name, right? Diversity, right? You think about a lot of different things. Variety. If you just look at the word diversity, you should think variety. So if you're talking about workplace diversity, usually they mean that you know, a uh, variety of different workers, different ethnic backgrounds, from different age groups. So obviously biodiversity, bio meaning life, would be a variety of living things. There's no need to write this next part down because we're going to talk about them separately. But <clears throat> biodiversity includes genetic diversity, and you're going to understand what that means later, species diversity, and then finally, ecosystem diversity. So basically, we're going to do something very specifically, and then it gets more broad. And again, we're going to discuss each one of these separately, so there's no need to write those down yet if you don't want. Any questions so far? Again, for this slide, the most important thing you need to know is what biodiversity is. It's the variety of living things. It's so important. So here we go, let's talk about genetic diversity. We've kind of hinted at genetic diversity already when we talked about the bottleneck effect, hence this picture of a cheetah. Any guesses on what genetic diversity is? Obviously it's diversity of, gen of genes, right? But the diversity of what genes? Your parents? That's, that's good. That would be a part of it. That would be very specific. It's a little bit more broad than that. I like that you want specific, because like I said, we're going to start specific and get more broad. So you are very specific, but if you get a little bit more broad, and you need to know this, genetic diversity is the genetic diversity in a population. So again, think about these cheetahs. We talked about that with the bottleneck effect, how you know, they had two bottleneck effects. So they went from a very large population to a very small population. And when you lose a lot of your population, then you lose a lot of genetic diversity. You lose a lot of alleles. So think about humans. And I know I've used this example a million and a half times, but think about all the people you know who have had flu and survived. But then think about all the people you've heard of that have had the flu and died from it. Same with COVID. That's because we have genetic diversity, among other things, as other conditions. But it's the fact that we have different alleles, right? So some of us are more susceptible to diseases. But if you have less diversity, then sometimes the disease could wipe out the whole uh, the whole population, for example. But anyway, here's everything I just said in writing. Genetic diversity, again, it's diversity in a population. Specifically, we mean variation in alleles. Right? So right now, uh, if it doesn't work this way, but if there was one allele, 
for skin color, and there was only two skin colors, white or black, it's not like that, right? But if that were the case, then this would be a very not diverse room right now, right? Because I know you guys can't see online, but we're all just white. If you're going to make it that like it's simple, which it's not, which means we all have the white allele. Which again, it's not that simple, but imagine that's what I'm trying to say, right? So it's these different alleles. So remember, think about when we learned what alleles were. A lot of times we were just talking about either or, right? Chin duple allele or not, um, attached earlobes or not. Remember, we learned about that, but we also learned that there's a lot of other situations in which there's more than two alleles. So again, variation alleles. That's what gen uh, genetic diversity is. As you already know, it is the raw material that makes up for. You know what? I don't even need to. We get rid of that micro word. I mean, that is true. It is from microevolution, but all evolution. Without the alleles, no evolution and adaptation will be possible. Including, yes, so I'm not saying it's not microevolution, but I'm saying it is all of evolution, it would not be possible without those variation in leaves. So, again, that's another important reason why genetic diversity is important. One, it just helps your population survive. Two, it helps your uh, population evolve. Of course, those things kind of go hand in hand, I understand. But still. So, if you lose a whole population, obviously um, you're going to lose a number of individuals in the species. And this might be confusing, so let me slow this down. These two bullet points might sound confusing, but you really need to think about it for a second. Because I just said if, you, if the population is lost and the number of individuals in the species declines, you think, yeah, no, no crap, right? But remember, I think when people think about population, they think about humans. So if I say we lost the population of humans, that would mean that every human on Earth died, right? But you can't think that way. When we're talking about populations, again, I'll just use squirrels as an example. If you talk about the population of squirrels on WBSU's campus, you know, that's a population of squirrels. They're the same species, they're interacting together, they're interbreeding, they're competing for the same resources. But then there's a population of squirrels on the New River Gorge, right? Those are two different populations. Yes, the same species, but the two different populations. Um, and if we lose all the population of the squirrels on WBSU's campus because it blows up because of the chemical plant next to us, right? That would be a population loss. But the species itself, right, there would still be squirrels on, on, on Earth. But every time you lose a population, you're going to lose, um, lose some individuals. So could population be like Oh, great, great question. And we're going to come to that. And the answer, the short answer is no. Because there is a specific definition for the word community. And it involves species. And I'll get there. I don't want to say it yet, but that's a great question. And we'll come to that. So again, losing individuals. This is why losing individuals, any individuals, is bad. It's bad for the population, right? Bad for the species as a whole. And this is where you get into this, I hate to use this term, but like the tree hugging idea. And you can only take it so far, but you know, if someone someone could have put up a fight and say, listen, you shouldn't build that Walmart there because to do it, you've got to cut down these trees. And but people are like, yeah, but those are sycamore trees and they're all over the place. And then they might say, yes, but for every sycamore tree, that's one individual loss, which is a little bit less genetic diversity. And that's true, but in that case, you know, it's a kind of a stretch of an argument, but it is still a true argument. So anyway, this is why it's important when people do say something like, well, we shouldn't kill this, or we shouldn't destroy this, because it does have an effect. When you lose even just a single individual, it does have an effect. Now, does it have a big enough effect to say you shouldn't build a Walmart here? I don't know about that, but it does have an effect. Anyway, are there any questions about this slide? Um, yep, yeah, I was just checking my notes here. If you download the PowerPoint and click this picture, it's actually a link to a video. It's a 12-minute video you can watch about um, the cheetah's lack of biological diversity. If I have time this week, I'm going to go through all these, click them myself, and come up with questions and share them with you for uh, independent work points. All right. So again, this isn't just a bunch of hippie tree hugging stuff. And I kind of consider myself, at least when it comes to the environment, a hippie tree hugger. But it's not just about that. It's also about money. For those of you who don't care about that, and just it's all about the money. Um, genetic diversity also has economic value. And your book talks about something called bioprospecting. I'm going to put it next to this, not because it's not important. It's because you know, I only have so many questions I can give you on an exam, and I'm not going to ask you about this. But bioprospecting is when you're looking for um, 
new medicines, like that's a huge one, right? We're looking for new medicines. A lot of new medicines are found, like in the Amazon, for example. Um, industrial chemicals, any other products, right? So people, biologists, are out looking for new things, new chemicals. And I know people usually think of the word chemical as, I don't know, this thing here. It's like, oh, there's chemicals in here, right? But remember when we took, well, that's just my just, but anyway, remember in chapter two, we learned about chemistry. Everything, every single element is technically a chemical. So this is chemicals, my coffee is chemicals, but when I say chemicals in this context, what I mean is new stuff, new compounds, new molecules that humans haven't come up with yet, and hopefully we can find them and put them in use. So anyway, that's one way that genetic diversity has economic value, but you might be reading that and then looking at these data and thinking, well, that makes no sense. What does that have to do with anything? But that second bullet point tells you um, we can also save our food supply. For example, these bananas. These are called Cavendish bananas. And you might not know this, but there used to be other bananas. So you know when you go to the grocery store and you look at the apples, there's a bunch of different apple varieties you can choose from. It used to be like that with bananas. But now that's pretty much the only one that exists, right? So probably in your life, whenever you've eaten a banana, it's been out of Cavendish. Um, here's the thing, though. They're all clones. Every single banana that we get, I would assume without um, without exception, is a clone. They're all clones of each other. It means like they're basically twins. So there's no genetic diversity. Meaning, if there's a pathogen, you know, some disease that comes around that could kill a banana tree, that means it could kill all the banana trees because there's no genetic diversity. There's no banana tree out there that's <laughs> immune to whatever is killing them, right? Um, and in fact, this isn't just some academic hypothetical conversation. There has been one that's merged and it has triggered a search for a wild species that um, is thought to have no value. So there are still other species of bananas out there, but they're not edible. Or they're not inedible as in they kill you, but they're not like edible like, oh, let's eat that, right? Um, and we haven't used them, but now they're out there, they're looking for it, saying, all right, what if we cross this with this? Looking for an edible banana, but still something that gives it more uh, diversity and resistance to that pathogen. It's a great independent work topic if you want to look into it. So I'm not giving you information, right? Um, what is the pathogen that's wiping them out? Where did it come from? When did it start? Where is our current situation worldwide? Like how, how in danger are we? What are the other wild species? All that kind of stuff. That is really interesting. If you look into it, you can find like an unmodified this is all from artificial selection. You find unmodified bananas, they still have black seeds in them. It's pretty neat, I think. Anyway, any questions about this? It's good attendance work right there, bananas. Yeah, I like it. I, I agree, let's do it. The next word for attendance is bananas. We'll leave off the cavendish. Also, and I haven't verified this yet, because I've heard it as a rumor. Sorry, this is not important for biology. But, I've heard, have you guys ever had like banana flavored candy stuff? Mm -hmm. Notice how that doesn't taste anything like bananas? I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I think that's because, or I've heard that it's because the flavor, the artificial banana flavor, is based on a banana that doesn't exist anymore. Like it wasn't a Cavendish banana, it was some other kind of banana. What about uh, banana chips? Are those from No, no, those are, yeah, those oh. are actually dehydrated. Okay, good question. Anyway, so if there's no questions about Genetic diversity, let's jump into species diversity. We'll give some specific information in the introduction. There's no need to write any of this down, but to talk about why it's important. The book says we are pushing species towards ex um, extinction. This is true. We might be in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. Actually, before I even talk about this, I should point out that things go extinct all the time. That's nature's way. Sometimes there are naturally mass extinctions, because like I said, we might be in the middle of a sixth. So the five other ones were not caused by humans. So, and a lot of people will point that out. If you try to talk anything about uh, environmentalism to somebody who only cares about the money, that's the first thing they're gonna say, or not the first thing, but that'll definitely be one of their argument points. They say, oh, things die all the time, naturally. And that's true. But your book's giving you some numbers. Um, at the present rate, we're losing things at a higher, 100 times higher than we have any time in the past 100,000 years. So. You know, and it's alarming. Here's another thing to think about that I don't think the book talks about. Even if it is natural, it doesn't mean it's survival. So, with any of the other five mass extinctions in um, Earth's history, 
sure, it might be natural, but if we have a mass extinction right now, that just might be humans are part of that mass extinction. So sure, the Earth will be okay, and nature's going to be all fine and dandy in the long run, but that doesn't mean we humans will. Anyway, at the current rate, over one half of all plants and animal species might be gone by the end of our century. Of course, this book was published, I think, in 2016, so these numbers might be a little bit different. It's another thing you can look up for independent work if you want. But again, there's nothing to write down here. This is just like the introduction to this discussion about species diversity. When we talk about it, I just want to tell you why it's important. Anyway, uh, your book gives some examples. He's a recent um, victim of uh, extinction, which is called the Hector's dolphin. No, excuse me, that's just endangered. But that's recently endangered. Of course, you can look that up too, because again, the book's a little bit old. What's the new, what's the status with Hector's dolphin? Is it still endangered? Is it's it like an hybrid of like a killer whale and a dolphin head. It does look like that. Side note, killer whales are more related to dolphins than they are whales. They're not oh, actually right. whales at all. But yeah, so you can look that up for independent work. Are they still endangered? Are they dead? Uh, another book example, the Formosan clouded leopard. They said at the time that this book was published that it was extinct. And if I remember correctly, they have been found since then. Taiwan, I don't think they're extinct anymore. So it's interesting how things change. I also recently just read an article, and I should have saved it. They found a mollusk that they thought was dead for millions of years because they've not only found fossils of it, and they recently found a living one. Anyway, here's some non book examples that I came up with years ago. So again, this might, well, no, these aren't changed. Um, the West African black rhinoceros is extinct. That happened about when this book was published, like right after the book was published. So I included that because at the time that was new information. So that's still relatively new, right? That's a new extinction. That species is now wiped off the planet. And then I picked some close examples that aren't new, but passenger pigeons and Carolina parakeets. Passenger pigeons were in the United States. We killed them off. So that's a close example. Carolina parakeet, if I remember correctly, was native to uh, or included West Virginia and then is now extinct. But anyway, um, you can look those up if you want for, for independent work and get some more information about it. I'm not going to test you on that. So your book gives you some more, more information about um, the situation. I'm going to put it next to this too. There are questions about this on the study guide, but I'm not going to ask you these specific questions on the exam. But um, your book points out that about 13% of the 10,004 bird species um, and about, what, a quarter of the 5,488 mammals are threatened with extinction. Um, over 20% of the freshwater fish became extinct during human history or seriously threatened. That's a lot, right? So human history, we've killed off, maybe not all of us, but I'm sure we had a, a big deal to do with it, over 20% of the species. Um, around 41% of amphibians are now threatened with extinction. And of the about 20,000 U.S. plants, 200 have become extinct. In the United States alone, right? And over 10,000 plants worldwide are threatened with extinction. So there's a lot. Basically, all your book is saying is species diversity is important for the same reason the genetic diversity is important. Um, you know, because we need all these different species. And it's weird the way we have to we have to teach it this way, but we have to teach you this, and then later I'm going to teach you what an ecosystem is. And then once you know what an ecosystem is, then I'm going to call back to this and say this is why species diversity is so important because we need all these different species for an ecosystem to work. We need an ecosystem to work for, for us to survive. So again, it's not just hippie tree huggers when they say save the whales. It's not just about that one species of whales. It's about everything, right? Because we're all interconnected, as you're going to learn when we talk about um, ecosystems. So if you lose one piece of the puzzle, it affects the whole puzzle. Anyway, any questions about that slide? That's it for species diversity. And again, we're going to come back to this idea once we learn about how ecosystems work. This is going to be a very important topic. The next thing we're going to talk about, speaking of ecosystems, is ecosystem diversity. And that'll be more important once you learn about what an ecosystem, once we really jump into what uh, ecosystems are and how they work. But for now, you do need to know this. You need to know what an ecosystem is. An ecosystem includes organisms and the abiotic factors in a particular area. So even though I'm going to give this to you formally later in the slideshow, I'm going to go ahead and say this now to answer her question. So you're already familiar with a population, right? A population 
It's a group of organisms of the same species, right? They're in the same place at the same time. They're breeding with each other. They're competing for the same resources, right? That's a population, like a population of squirrels on WBSU's campus. And then if you take a step up, there's something called a community. So then you're not just looking at the squirrels, how they interact with each other, breed with each other, and fight for the same resources. Then you're also looking at all the other living things that they interact with, right? So um, the, the oak trees that the squirrels eat, feral cats that try to kill the squirrels, right? The humans that try not to run over the squirrels, uh, the grass the squirrels might hide in, whatever. So when we're talking about WBSU campus and we're talking about a community, that means we're talking about every living thing on WBSU's campus. All the nematodes in the soil, all the bacteria on us and all this desk, right? Every living thing on campus, that is a community. An ecosystem is just one step up from that. So if we're looking at the ecosystem of WBSU's campus, we're still talking about all the living things, and then we're also talking about the abiotic factors, the non-living factors. For example, the grass that grows on this wall of Hamblin, like right next to it, is probably different than the grass that grows on that wall of Hamblin. Why? Because the sun does different things, right? Some of this grass is probably getting a lot more sunlight than the others. And the sun is an abiotic factor. It's not living, but it affects which plants grow where. And of course, if you have a certain species of grass growing here versus there, then you probably have different herbivores that eat the grass living here than you have living there. Does that make sense? And then again, the squirrels, right? So my guess is, and I don't know for, for a fact, you might have more squirrels in the middle of the campus than you do on that side of the campus because there's the highway there and it makes a lot of noise and hopefully they're afraid of it. Probably not, they seem pretty stupid. I've seen too many of them in the road, but let's assume that's true. So anyway, you guys understand now what an ecosystem is, right? It's not just all the living things interacting with each other. It's then also all the abiotic factors, the sun, um, humans, noise, rain, temperature, all that stuff. Um, anyway, now that we got past that little point, due to the interactions among different species, the loss of one species can have a negative effect on an entire ecosystem. So this is what I said in the previous thing. When we were talking about species diversity, this is what I was saying. So really that bullet point kind of belongs in the other spot now that I think about it. Because we're not talking about, I don't want to confuse it yet, but anyway, yeah. That bullet point is still true, but it's more accurate for the previous um, section, which was species diversity. So anyway, why is this important? Why do we care about ecosystems? Let's move past the tree hugging hippie stuff. It's because ecosystems give us ecosystem services, and you need to know what those are for the exam. Ecosystem services are functions that are performed by an ecosystem that directly or indirectly benefit people. So again, this goes beyond, if you took my bio 108 class, you would understand there's a term called intrinsic value. So we might give, somebody might give intrinsic value to all living things, which might be the tree hugging hippie term that I like to use. But it's not just about that. It's also, if you want to be just selfish about it, it's like, who cares about all the other species? It's all about humans. Even if you feel that way, that's fine. It comes back to this. We still need this. We need air and water. We need climate regulation. We need erosion control. We need food, right? So basically, another thing we could say about ecosystem services is without ecosystems, we won't survive, right? Think about how much money NASA spends for air and water purification in the space stations and their rockets and climate regulation, right? That's a lot of money. It's because there are no ecosystems up there, right? We don't think much of it because we just breathe in and out. But imagine if something happened to Earth where there was, I don't know, if something happened and we just didn't have oxygen. How hard it would be to survive and how expensive if we had to make oxygen somehow and put it in tanks and everybody carried around tanks or how much money we spend currently, or I do anyway, I'm sure you do too, on climate regulation in your house, making it hotter, making it colder. All these things um, are helped by with ecosystem services. So know this, definitely know that. I'm gonna put an X through this because these are just examples, but some examples are the forests absorb and store carbon, that's helpful. Um, coral reefs provide food, that's great for us. Storm protection, great for us. Recreation, great for us. I love this example. You guys might not uh, love it as much as I do, but I grew up in the Florida Keys, among other places. So this is really important. We had coral reefs. So yeah, I gave us some food, but we also had grocery stores. So that wasn't that big of a deal. 
the storm protection was huge. So when you had a big storm surge coming in from hurricanes, which we had a number of times, that helped, right? So we didn't get obliterated. And this one, the, the reefs helped, is that what you're saying? Uh -huh. Okay. Because the water is coming in, and even though it's underwater, you can't see it, but it is stopping it. Gotcha. Then they have mangroves that also help, but we don't have time to get into that. But the big one for me was recreation, because my aunt and my mom worked at a, a hotel down there, and my uncle ran a, a dive boat. So everybody was coming to see the coral reefs. So even though, yes, we needed to survive and all that hippie stuff, like you keep saying, sometimes it's also about money, right? People making millions of dollars um, off the ecosystem. We do here in the West, in West Virginia too. Think about how many people come to the Hatfield and McCoy Trail, how many people go to um, the New River Gorge, so on and so forth. They're going to see the beauty of the nature, right? That's the ecosystem. We could make some money if we just cut all those trees down and turn it into lumber. But we can make more money if you leave it alone and have people come in for as tourists. But anyway, your book also gets really specific about coral reefs. I'm going to put an X to this because, again, that's very specific. I'm not going to ask you these questions on the exam. I feel like whoever wrote this book, some of them had to be from South Florida. Because there was the lionfish example in the last chapter. Now they keep talking about coral reefs. But anyway, coral reefs are rich in species diversity, yet about 20% of them have been destroyed by humans. That was back when this was published. I'm sure that number is a little bit higher now. 75% 75 of the threatened and expected to top 90% by 2030 if the current uses continue. The next word for attendance will be this little blue guy right here, which is a starfish. I know none of you are astronomers or biologists, but a little known fact is starfish are neither stars nor fish. Take that to your next trivia night. Are there any questions about that slide? All right, so now that we know about biodiversity, let's talk about the causes of declining biodiversity. And I want to point out again, really quickly, this is important. This probably you know, this stuff is really, really important. It's not just some academic thing like the, you know, we talked about the red-headed woodpecker and like, oh, let's hope it does. Like, this is important for human survival. This is important for economies, right? This is important for people to have make a living. Ecosystems are very important. Anyway, don't need to write this down because we're going to talk about them individually, but the four main factors, you can't write it down if you want, but you'll have a chance to write it down later. The four main factors of declining biodiversity are habitat destruction and fragmentation, invasive species, which we've already talked about a little bit in the previous chapter, over-exploitation, which we've already talked about in the previous semester, I mean chapter, and then pollution. And even though we're going to talk about them separately, and I'm going to say this again later, I won't point this out. When you think about it, number two, three, and four, they all funnel into number one. Invasive species destroy habitats. I mean, not physically. Well, no, sometimes they physically do too, but over-exploitation, again, destroys habitats. Again, not physically. It's not like you're going in and taking down a mountaintop or cutting down trees, but you are messing up the habitat. They invite or sleep at that. And obviously pollution is going to destroy a habitat. Um, your book also points out that the expanding size and dominance of human population is the root of all four factors. And that is so true. What a great week to learn about this, because again, like I mentioned earlier, earlier in the week, we finally hit 8 billion. So we have 8 billion people on Earth now. Which is a lot. So obviously, the more people we have, the worse that's going to get, generally speaking. Of course, one of those 8 billion people might be somebody who comes up with some great solution to fix one of these, so we shall see. Anyway, like I said, we're going to talk about them each individually, so let's talk about the first one, which is habitat destruction. Um, I'm going to put an X to this, because you don't need to know these examples, and those are just some examples. There's so many examples, but habitat destruction and fragmentation is from a lot of things. Agriculture is a big one, right? We all need to eat. It's not like there's just naturally farms out there, right? We all have to either cut down trees or clear, uh, uh, clear land of native grasses, for example, to plant these farms, right? So agriculture is a big one. Urban development, we all need places to live. Forestry, we need trees to build those houses that we live in. Mining, that's a huge one, obviously, here in West Virginia, which is why I picked this picture that's not from the textbook, but it is from West Virginia. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, mountaintop removal. 
I like they, they, they call them modern films, don't they? I'm don't pretty know. sure. I don't know, maybe. But yeah, it's a great picture because I love the time of day, the time of year they took it. So it's all nice and pretty with the colors changing. And then there's like, you can see where they've already cleared that one and put the grass back on. And then, and then, awesome. Yeah, it is. I mean, we need coal, but you know, it is a nice one. Anyway, here's the other thing you definitely need to know for the exam. Habitat destruction of the four that we're talking about is the greatest threat to biodiversity. More than pollution or invasive species or over-exploitation, habitat destruction. And again, like I said, the other three kind of feed into that anyway, right? So invasive species destroy habitats, pollutions destroy habitats, over-exploitation over um, destroys habitats. So hopefully you can remember that all three, all the other three also destroy habitats. I hope that I hope you remember that habitat destruction is the greatest threat to biodiversity. You should know that for the exam. And technically, like building the city is also. Oh yeah. That's kind of yeah. Okay. That's a huge one. Anytime you're, anytime you're changing the nat nature to do anything different, even just putting in a road, which isn't as big as putting in a whole city, but yeah. that's where the well, we don't have time, or your book doesn't get into it. We don't have time to talk to it too much, but this is all destruction, right? Mm -hmm. Easy. That's easy to look at that. And say that's destruction. But even fragmentation. Would be like putting a road in the middle of the forest. It's not nearly as bad as destruction, but there, it, there is a difference. Yeah, it. it will mess with the biodiversity. Like if you have 100 square miles of forest and would have you know whatever biodiversity is up here, and if you were just put one road down the middle of it, and the biodiversity would be a little bit less. Now maybe your book doesn't mention that. Anyway, is it like you know how deer will part of the path? Walk on, mm -hmm. it's kind of like their road. Is that, is that, is that habitat destruction? That's a great question. And generally speaking, no. Generally speaking, if it's natural, that means things have evolved to for it to be that way. In which case, it's what's expected. Just like you know, beaver dams. You know, that's huge because that will block a whole river. And what used to be a little trickling stream is now a pond, which are two completely different ecosystems. Uh, but because it's natural, things are evolved to deal with it, and it's not considered habitat destruction. Great question. So all the humans can really do that in habitat. In a sense. But then to bring it back to what we're going to talk about, bring it forward <laughs> to what we're going to talk about later. If humans introduce something like an invasive species, and then they, you know, physically destroy the habitat, then that's still on humans because we put it in there. But again, that would be something because it's invasive, it's not from there, so things aren't evolved to handle. So basically, if it's anything that destroys the habitat, that um, that habitat, the, the living things in that habitat are not involved to withstand. Yeah. So like the um, the road that <clears throat> pardon me, goes through Canal State Forest and mm -hmm. brings you out the other side, mm -hmm. past Canal City, and then everybody tosses their tires on the <sighs> bed, that would be destruction. Yeah, well, probably fragmentation, but yeah. Okay. And you know, it's not always that bad. It is always a little bad, but obviously if it was so bad, we would just be like, all right, let's not do any more roads. We can't, right? Well, that's not possible, right? We have to have roads, we have to have houses. So it's just a balance between what do we need for humans and not destroying things because we also need that. Great questions. Um, and I'm gonna put an X to this as well, just because I'm not gonna ask these specifics, but um, habitat destruction and fragmentation affects over 85% of birds, mammals, and amphibians um, with extinction. So that's just your book's way of saying, again, this isn't just some academic discussion. This is important. It's important for not just the survival of those bird, mammals, and amphibians, as we briefly touched upon earlier, it's for the survival of the ecosystems. And without ecosystems, we don't survive. So it is a matter of life and death. Again, not to say it's going to kill us all if we put one more mount top removal. I'm not being that dramatic. I'm just saying overall, in the big picture, it is a matter of life and death. But again, not every single decision that causes habitat destruction is something that we should avoid because we, we have to do some of it. So anyway, that's it for habitat destruction. Let's move on back to invasive species, which we talked about in the last chapter. So this will be a quick review, which is good because we only have about two more minutes before the guy gets here to do the reviews or the... Uh, evaluations. That is the second greatest site of biodiversity. So you should know that too. The first habitat destruction, number two, invasive species. 
I'm going to go through this really quickly because you already know this from chapter 19. What do invasive species do? They compete with native species. As a matter of fact, they outcompete native species, generally speaking. When they're not doing that, they're preying upon native species. Right? So the, the pythons was a good example of that. They're not necessarily, you know, they, they are outcompeting some things, but their biggest problem is they're preying, they're killing the native species. And then, of course, um, some of them, obviously, not everything preys upon stuff. Sometimes they parasitize stuff. So, anyway, any questions about invasive species? All right, that's a great place to end it. Um, well, we just about two minutes or one minute. That's okay with you. Hey, you go for it. I must forget to come up here. Yeah. <laughs> the other one we've already talked about too: over exploitation. This is all very common sense. You know, it's when you're pulling stuff out quicker than it can be replenished. And we already talked about that. We talked about ecological footprints and biocapacity, right? When you're using more than being produced. That's not good. That's not sustainable. And that's all we're saying here. We're just saying the same thing we talked about in chapter 19. We're, we're saying it again. But then your book gives some specific examples. I'm not going to ask you about all these. Tigers, American bison, Galapagos tortoises. Great independent work topic if you want to look into those specifically or if you want to look at some other examples of overexploitation. Um, and also, your book points out because a lot of times when people think of overexploitation, they think of things like overfishing. But the book points out sometimes it's also things like plants. So mahogany and rosewood are a great example of plants. None of which I'm going to ask you on the exam. Um, just the point is, it's not sustainable when you take more than what's given, right? That's not sustainable. Pretty simple concept. And as you remember, like we talked about in the last chapter, it's not always immediately noticeable, right? So the fact that our ecological footprint might be what one slightly higher than the biocapacity. You might be thinking, well, how is that possible? How is it that we're using more than we're producing, but we're not all dead yet? Because it's like I said, the Earth had four billion years to build up savings, so to speak. Right? So yeah, we're spending more than we're making, but we're dipping into our savings. Um, and it is 840. Pollution, I don't even need to say anything. I'm not gonna ask you any questions about it. I'll just leave it at that, because you know what pollution is, right? There's water pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, light pollution. It all affects um, ecosystems in bad ways. You can read all the examples. And that's it. So when we come back on Monday, we will start the second main bullet point. He's going to do the evaluations. Um, yeah, that's it. And then while he's doing that, maybe the three of us can take our picture for your extra extra credit. And who wants to, do you want to, be, want to take a picture for us? I'll take it. All right. Every Friday we do. Oh well, look, you can get it on a picture too. Yeah. Do, it's Red Friday. It's re, re, red stands for remember everyone employed to take pictures for the. Dude, I'm wearing red. I know that's what I'm saying. What so I'm wearing, you, can, <laughs> you can get in on it if you want. Holy crap! Do it every so week. It was meant to be, I had a black shirt on this morning. I thought I had it doesn't. Yeah, here right. we go. Here we go. Yeah. We got yeah. a new one in. Get on this. Look at that. Is this for extra credit? Yep, yep, yep. Sweet. Nice. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so that being out of the way, I'm going to get out of here. How weird. I had that shirt on. I wore it around from that. I'm like, God, this doesn't do it right. I don't like it. Oh, I can't wear that all day. Divine intervention.